Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Workers Speak, the State of Working Wisconsin and Policy Priorities. This event is presented in collaboration with Kids Forward, the High Road Strategy Center, the Milwaukee Area Service and Hospitality Workers Union, and Worker Justice Wisconsin. My name is Adrian Padgett, and I'll be co-facilitating the event today with John Wesley Days at Kids Forward. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few quick logistical matters. Laura Dresser, the Associate Director of the High Road Strategy Center and lead author of the State of Working Wisconsin, will give a brief overview of the Wisconsin economy, who's winning, who's losing out, and how that varies by gender and race. We will then turn it over to John, who will engage our worker panelists on key issues that impact their lives. Afterwards, we will open things up for questions from you, our audience. Now to today's event, Laura Dresser is a labor economist and expert on low-wage work and the workforce development system. For more than two decades, she has led the work on the state of working Wisconsin, which documents work and inequality in our state. She has also written about low-wage jobs, care work, inequality, and, the, and labor market reform. Laura is a clinical associate professor at the University of Wisconsin, Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work. Laura, take it away. Thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you all uh, to for being here. I'm thrilled to be part of this event and especially happy to know that I'll just hit some highlights from the report and then we'll really um, get to hear from uh, workers themselves. Uh, in some ways, the project of the State of Working Wisconsin, which I've been working on um, since I started this job in the mid-1990s, uh, every year we around Labor Day get to release this report, um, is to really focus on a worker's perspective on what's going on in the economy, to center the experience of uh, workers rather than uh, the kind of data and uh, reports on the economy that focus more on what elites are getting out of the economy. Um, we want to make sure that the economy works uh, at the middle and works for everyone. And so a lot of times focusing both on the general data on medians, but also on distributions and inequalities. So just a quick review for you, and you can see more at workingwi.org where the whole report sits. Um, you know, from my perspective, if I'm talking about a worker's perspective on this economy, this is good in the cyclical sense that labor markets are tight, unemployment rates are low, and um, job growth is steady. This matters to all workers, not just workers who are looking for work, but workers who are in jobs when, as I say, at the line outside the door, the people looking for a job is shorter. You have more bargaining power inside the job you have. And so workers have leveraged that bargaining power over these last, um, since the recovery from the pandemic and have secured wage increases. At the median, last year's wage increase, it's adjusted for inflation. So the increase from 22 to 23 was the highest increase we've seen, uh, matched only by 2019. So these are high, so it's about a dollar an hour more at the median in 23 than 22, making up for the losses incurred because of inflation, the high inflation in 1922, uh, I'm sorry, 20, 1922, 20,022. So, um, so strong wage growth. And what's most important to me is it's equalizing wage growth. And when I say that, what I mean is like, if we stack up all the workers from the lowest paid worker to the highest paid worker, and we look at this one, that's like 20% of people are below them, 80% of people are above them, the 20th percentile worker, that worker's wage has gone up 8%. At the median, wages up 4%. At the high end, wages up 1%. This means that wages are equalizing. This doesn't happen in the U.S. economy much. You know, we have an economy where people who suffer tend to, when events happen, they suffer more. This economy is so tight that it is, that it is workers at the bottom end who are securing the greater gains. And I think that is because those workers are demanding more of work in individual and collective ways. Um, and so that's, I think, my kind of top line on the state of working Wisconsin. Um, but it's more important, uh, I think at this point, there's a lot of data at the report, you can go find that, but to hear from the workers themselves about what their experience of this economy is, um, 
when I say that it's equalizing, I don't mean things are great. Um, the bottom of the labor market has been neglected for too long and all sorts of um, violations of dignity and law happen at the bottom of the labor market. Our minimum wage has been neglected far too long and the or collective bargaining rights of workers in the state are challenged. And so for these reasons, I had to hear about policies related to these things. I'm going to hand it over to uh, John Leslie Days, my colleague at Kids Forward. Thank you so much, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today to hear from Wisconsin workers on the specific challenges they face and policy changes that can help ensure the well being of all workers living in Wisconsin, especially Black, Brown, immigrant, and rural families, individuals who are often exploited for their labor. The High Road Strategy Center, the Milwaukee Area for Service and Hospitality Workers Union, Workers Justice Wisconsin, and Kids Forward have embarked on a partnership that demands policy recommendations come directly from workers themselves and not isolated experts. We've identified policy demands based on issues expressed by workers directly. We will hear from workers themselves to learn how specific policy changes aren't just hopeful phrases put together uh, but hold the potential to impact thousands of families across our state. Our coalition's current policy priorities are criminalize wage theft and the misclassification of workers, raise the minimum wage to a living wage, ensure the right to organize a union in the workplace, and expand driver's licenses for all. In this discussion, we'll be focusing directly on the first three of our policy priorities, which are rooted in the workplace, and respond to key data from the State of Working Wisconsin's report. Expanding driver's licenses for all is an issue of equal importance and a priority for the coalition. We'll be working on all four issues in the coming months. To read more about these issues, please visit reimaginewisconsin.org. That's reimaginewisconsin.org, all one word. For the next 40 minutes, we'll be talking with workers about their experiences. And at 1 p.m., we will open up to the general conversation with all the speakers and have general questions and answers. So without further delay, we would like to bring up our first guests. So as I stated, our first discussion is about wage theft and the misclassification and abuse of workers. We believe that cracking down on wage theft and misclassification ensures that all workers, regardless of their immigration status or background, receive fair treatment and the wages they have earned. This is a substantial problem. Every year, companies fail to pay workers the wages they have earned. They steal millions of dollars that are owed to working families. Employers also misclassify workers as independent contractors to avoid paying payroll taxes and workers' compensation insurance. Both wage theft and misclassification are illegal, but also way too common. According to Workers' Justice Wisconsin, in 2021, the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development recovered over $700,000 in, in unpaid wages, and they generated over $14.5 million by bringing employers into compliance. Since January 2021, Workers Justice Wisconsin has identified $583,631 in stolen wages, mostly in Dane County. During that time period, Worker, Just Worker Justice Wisconsin has helped recover $352,228 in stolen wages. More than 10% of construction workers are misclassified annually, and most of them are Latino workers. Misclassified construction workers earn about $23,500 less per year than correctly classified workers. I'd like to welcome Noli Bell Villasmil, speaking for her hu husband, Hendrix 
Bermúdez, Luis Miguel Morales Membreno, and Diego Bermúdez, who have worked with Worker Just Justice Wisconsin to listen to their experiences of this issue. So let's work. Let's move to the first question. What kind of work were you doing when your wages were stolen, and how much are you owed in stolen wages? Luego que pasó el tiempo, nos pusieron a hacer otro trabajo que era como un cargo más más alto y no nos estaban pagando lo que debían. Y en total lo que nos quedaron debiendo entre los tres eran dos mil setecientos sesenta y cinco dólares. So we were working construction. Um, we were hired as helpers for a construction project. And as time passed, we were then assigned into a different role that should have come with a higher pay, with more responsibilities, but they did not match that. And so between the three of us, they owe us $2,765. Thank you. What are you doing to recover your stolen wages at the moment? ¿Qué están haciendo para recuperar sus salarios robados? Eh, hemos estado, cuando nos pasó ese, eso, en realidad la plata la necesitábamos. Y lo comentamos con varios amigos, personas cercanas a nosotros. Y una de esas personas nos recomendó aquí, Urquiz Obrera, Urquiz. Y aquí hemos estado en ese proceso. Eh, firmamos unos papeles, hicimos un contrato con la señora eh, Socorro. Y ya hemos hecho dos cartas. Una se la entregamos al señor Tobías, que es el dueño del restaurante Casa Zaragoza. Y la otra carta se la entregamos al contratista Francisco Guzmán. Y tuvieron siete días para darnos respuesta a esas cartas. Y aún no tenemos respuesta. Tenían chance hasta el día de ayer. Y aún no tenemos respuesta a eso. Yeah, so we, uh, we needed this money badly. Um, we commented about it to friends and people close to us. And one of these friends recommended Worker Justice Wisconsin to us. Um, we came here, we spoke with Socorro and helped us sign some papers, draft a contract, and wrote two letters, one to Tobias, um, the owner of Casa Zaragoza, and another to the, the contractor, Francisco Guzman, and gave them dos, dos semanas? Siete. To Gave them seven days to respond, and uh, that delay that um, yesterday was the last day, and up until then we have not heard back from him either. Gracias. Uh, my next question is: What have you learned in the process uh, of trying to recover these stolen wages? ¿Qué ha aprendido en el proceso durante el trabajo de recuperar sus salarios. Aprendimos nuestros derechos laborales, este, sabemos que organizar colectivamente es clave y que nos afecta también como familia y nos rompe mucho la estabilidad, este, tanto vivienda como económica. Mucha, muchas, muchas cosas. En todo nos afecta porque prácticamente dependemos de nuestro trabajo. Entonces... Uh -huh. En, en realidad, en ese momento que nos pasó eso, la plata la necesitábamos mucho. Entonces, no es fácil. Somos una familia que nuestro compañero no tiene que su familia. trabajar por, por casi un mes y a la hora del arriendo, no, no hay plata. Y eso, eso no lo va a entender la persona que no, con la que hicimos el contrato de arrendar la casa. Y no claro, es fácil. porque a ellos no les importa si, si necesitan su plata. Uh -huh. um, So yes, we learned about our, our rights as workers. We learned that organizing is key to solving the issue and that it affects us as a family. It uh, breaks the stability that we have economically. It affects our housing. It affects us in many different ways. Um, we depended on this money. We are counting on it. We really badly needed it. And imagine you work for an entire month and rent is due and suddenly the money's not coming. Um, The landlord, of course, does not care uh, where it's coming from or what the situation is. So, yes, it affects us greatly. Yeah, no es fácil mismo. Finally, I want to ask, what do you think or why do you think, really, immigrants are targeted for this practice? Finalmente, este, ¿por qué 
esto pasa con los inmigrantes. Pienso que por lo que no, o sea, piensan que no tenemos derechos o sea, aquí en este país y que somos blanco fácil también para el abuso de trabajo. Porque, por ejemplo, él lo que nos decía que si él quería, él no nos pagaba. O sea, pues como que no pueden hacer nada. No o sea, tomen pago, esto, si no, bueno, no les pago. O sea, sí. es lo que siempre les decía. Sí. Entonces piensa que somos un blanco fácil para el abuso de trabajo. Uh -huh. Solamente por el hecho de que, como, por ejemplo, ahorita estamos nosotros en un proceso para estar legal en un Prácticamente ilegal no estamos, pero no tenemos como que un permiso para poder trabajar. Entonces, como nos contratan así, o sea, por eh, a través de otra persona, otra persona, así como lo necesitamos, tampoco le, como que no, no le damos tanta importancia a eso, solo hacemos lo que hay que hacer y ya. Pero en realidad sí nos afecta demasiado eso, porque no es la primera vez que nos pasa, ni, ni a los únicos que nos pasa, de que no nos pagan o cualquier cosa. Yeah, um, we think this happens because people think we don't have rights, um, that we are easy targets for uh, abuse in the workplace. Um, for instance, the, the owner told us that if he didn't want to pay us, that he didn't have to, that he wasn't going to um, take it or leave it, essentially. Um, and yeah, only because um, we are right now in a, in a process of getting our papers or getting our status. We're in a little bit of a limbo between undo being undocumented and actually having a status and having a work permit. So you have to take these jobs that are kind of under the table um, and you don't have another option other than that. Um, and they know that really. Um, and we know that we are not the only people that this affects and this is not the first time this has happened to us as well. Well, thank you so much for your responses and thank you for the excellent translation. Uh, sharing your experiences and these powerful insights. Uh, we ask our audience to please uh, place questions uh, in the chat and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end. Now, let us turn uh, to the topic of minimum wage. This issue of raising the minimum wage, which would raise the floor under all workers, we believe all workers deserve fair compensation to support themselves and their families. For those who may not know, Wisconsin is one of only 20 states that has not yet raised the minimum wage above the federal floor of $7.25, which it set more than a decade ago. The minimum for tipped workers is just $2.33 per hour. Raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour would raise wages for one in four black workers and more than one in four Latino workers in Wisconsin. Raising the minimum wage is a popular policy supported by conservatives and liberals alike and a way to strengthen labor and living standards. Minimum wages are above $10 per hour in Michigan and Minnesota and $13 per hour in Illinois. I'd like to welcome Faith Roska from the Opportunity Youth Initiative and youth-led project currently housed at Kids Forward, and Troy Brewer from the Milwaukee Area for Service and Hospitality Workers Union, known as MASH, to share their experiences now. For starters, could you both please introduce yourselves and share a little bit about the sort of work you do and have done in the past? Hi, my name is Faith. I work with Kids Forward under the Opportunity Youth Initiative. Um, we work with disenfranchised youth between the ages of 16 to 24 who are not engaged in community initiatives or the traditional K through 12 four year college or university system. Um, I started this work in the summer of 2022. Since then, I've worked on this project. I also was a systems advocate at People Progression for about a year. Um, I really just focus on individuals in the community who are maybe not getting what they need or don't have the access to what they need um, and helping grant that access and also doing projects with data um, and trying to collect community informed data within communities by community members and using that data for projects or funding for said community. Hello, my name is Troy Brewer. I'm the chief union steward down at the 
by their form. Um, also a proud member of MASH, our lead cook as well down at the Pfizer Forum, member organizer, and and uh, the UBS treasurer. Thank you so much. Uh, Faith, Troy, if Wisconsin's minimum wage was double its current value, about $15 per hour, how would this sensible change affect your own life and your sense of security? Um, I think that Wisconsin doubling the minimum wage would make a lot of sense. I think it's a bit concerning that we're still at 725. Um, current calculators estimate that you would be, need to be making at least 19 to live on your own without a roommate in the state of Wisconsin with like the minimum, right? That's like a one bedroom apartment, paying utilities, paying groceries, paying your bills, and you're not saving anything on top of that each month. And that's just in the more like rural parts of Wisconsin. And when I say rural, that even includes, play like I live in the Appleton area. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure what that number would be in places that are closer to Milwaukee or Madison or maybe Green Bay where prices are a little bit higher. Um, I think if we were to double that minimum wage, people would be a lot more secure in that they would be able to afford to live and they would be able to afford to feed their families and children. So like that $19 number that I said before, that's for like just me, a single adult in my home. Um, that's not accounting for maybe children, maybe siblings, maybe other people that you have to take care of. Um, 725 is just not, it's not feasible in any sense for any person who's living on their own and paying bills in Wisconsin. Thank you. Agree. To be honest with you, $15 an hour, a minimum wage thing, it would help a lot of people, but it still wouldn't be enough. You wouldn't be able to feed, clothe, or shelter your family. Uh, so from the floor looking up to the ceiling, it should be at least $20 an hour, and that's still not enough. I mean, on a yearly average, uh, Wisconsin may see increases from two to five percent on food, housing, gas, utilities, clothing, et cetera. So fifteen dollars is way better than twenty five, but it's really not enough. Thank you, Troy. You both in your response have spoken as to how this will be a positive impact on your community. Um, I want to go a little deeper into what that would look like on a granular level. Maybe you can give us an experience uh, that you have heard of in the community that would talk about beyond just yourselves, how this would have a positive impact on your community. Um, I can talk about how even receiving a job with a higher wage had a positive impact on me. I mean, I'm very young. I'm only 21 and I live on my own. And that's kind of like within my friends and my peers from school and stuff like that, like none of my other friends are really doing that. None of my other friends are really able to do that. I'll say for myself more on a surface level, because again, I don't have children. I don't have some of these more quote unquote real world things to really worry about. I know how much it stressed me. Like I hated living with roommates. I hated it was like scraping by. It was very, very difficult. Um, and so now that I am able to live on my own, I mean, I'm still not like swimming in it. Right. But it's like, it's just much less stress to not have to count on my parents, to not have to count on other people, to know that I know where my rent payment is going to come from. I also think that when you have members in the community that are making a living wage and are able to pay their bills and aren't having to struggle, you see much less conflict, much less crime. Um, one, people aren't having to commit crime to get just what they need on a basic level, right? But two, financial stress is a huge psychological impact on relations between people, whether it's in your home, in the community, having stability, especially for your family has a big impact on how you interact with the world around you day to day, and even how you're interacting with yourself internally. Um, and when people can afford to house themselves, house their families, it just has a much positive impact on them and it makes for a much more cohesive community overall. Thank you, Faith. You're not, yeah, I think $15 an hour would have a positive effect on a lot of communities in the city of Milwaukee. I mean, we have some of the most impoverished zip codes, not just in the state, but the whole country. Uh, so I believe it would cut down on crime. It would give people a sense of pride. I can remember when neighborhoods were, when the auto industry was thriving, we had tanneries, we had factories, Briggs and Stratton, all those type of things. And people just had a sense of pride 
And I think it would just change a whole lot of the way people think. Thank you, Troy. In my introduction uh, to talking about this, uh, I mentioned, and as, as I've been informed by my colleagues, that raising the minimum wage is a popular policy supported by conservatives and liberals alike. So what are the real things that are preventing this from happening, from your understanding? I think one of the biggest things that you hear over and over again, not just in Wisconsin, but on a national level, is that a lot mm -hmm. of employers can't afford to pay $15 an hour. Um, and everybody kind of has their own opinions on those statements. Some employers really can't. But that leads into question, why has the cost of living gone up so much that small businesses, like real people running businesses and trying to employ other real people can't even afford to give them a living wage. It's not that these employees don't deserve a living wage, but I think that it kind of opens up a larger conversation as to if the why is the cost of living so high that normal people trying to run businesses can't afford to retain employees? Because that's a whole different issue in and of itself, because that leaves a lot of employment opportunities only in the hands of like these huge corporations, because you have Places like McDonald's now that advertise for above $15, hour, $15 an hour starting. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but companies like McDonald's can afford to do that as opposed to maybe a mom and pop shop at, at like your local downtown. They really genuinely may not be able to afford that. And that may be something that leads them to go out of business. And that's even less money circulating in your own community. Um, I don't know. I think it's an all over issue. I think that minimum wage and cost of living should be the same conversation because the increases in cost of living that we're seeing, not just statewide, but nationwide are extremely concerning. And while working class people can't keep up, working class business owners also can't keep up. Mm -hmm. I believe it all starts with like city officials, uh, legislatures, just people making laws and passing laws. I mean, I just really think they failed us pretty much in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, too many loopholes for billion dollar corporations to just continue to get richer, richer, and the poor just stay bitter and stay poorer. Uh, so it, it all has to start somewhere. And we got to elect officials and, and things like that, the people that's gonna ride with us and do things for us. Otherwise, things will never change. Well, thank you so much, Troy and Faith, for your your responses, sharing your experiences with minimum wages and making a compelling case for the need to raise the floor underneath all of us. Uh, for the final policy issue of this webinar, I'd like to, like to talk to Troy a bit now about unions and the right to organize. We know ensuring the right to organize is a crucial counterbalance to systemic racism and corporate influence. It is evident when workers organize that they can challenge injustices and demand accountability from employers, as we heard on this webinar early on. Union workers earn more in their jobs and unions are a powerful force to improve the lives of working people. Wisconsin has enacted policies that make unionization much harder. This is obvious. Repealing these anti-union policies will allow workers to uh, easily join together and, uh, and fight for these rights for the community. Troy, we already know a little about your work experience, but unlike a lot of cooks in this world, you actually worked as a cook in both union and non-union settings. So for starters, could you talk about how being in a union has changed your experience being a service worker? For starters, being in a union has opened my eyes to just how, how unfairly I was treated, how unjust the whole system was. And for over a quarter of a century, I worked in a place where it was like, is my way or the highway you that's for pay increases and things will be like, I'll get back to you. Things never happen. It's treated badly. They talk to you any type of way and they can just get rid of you just because they didn't like you or just because you stood up for something you believe you were wronged by. So when approached with a union thing and the type of work that I do, I was taken aback. Like, yeah, right. It was like, 
could it really do something for me? So it was really a selfish thing, but getting into a union building and, and being treated with dignity and respect, it changed my whole outlook on things. How does having a union protect workers in situations where something goes wrong that's specific and such as scheduling issues? So being in a union, I mean, we protect workers' rights in many situations. It's more than just helping out with people that are being disciplined or when people are in trouble, but as far as scheduling and things go, just like in the past month, month and a half, people were scheduled wrongly. Uh, we've written grievances and we've gotten back, back paying for people over $10,000. And I'm just, that's at the, the low minimum. I mean, we help out with a whole lot of different things and it's more than just, uh, like when people get in trouble, we do a whole lot more than that. For sure. And you do a lot of work organizing your coworkers to be part of MASH, your organization. When you are getting coworkers to sign up to be members, what is your best pitch to get them to join? When it comes to getting uh, coworkers to sign up to be a part of the union, it's pretty simple. I really give them my story of where I was, where I've been, and where the union is headed. And uh, it's pretty much a no-brainer. They, they, there are no pros and, and there are no cons to this. And it's just the more people that sign up, the more power we have. Mass uh, with our employee, Levy, has about 97% card signage, which makes it very hard for the employer to say, hey, you guys really don't matter. Your voice doesn't have to be heard. It just... Uh, it just says that, hey, we're here and we, and, we're, and we will take nothing less than what we really deserve. Truly a, a, an institution that strengthens democratic practices uh, in our country. Thank you for that. I have uh, one last question for you. What would it mean for workers and for you if there, if there was more unionization in the service sector, specifically in Milwaukee? Having more unionization in the service sector could mean everything to uh, people in Milwaukee. Not only would it give people a sense of stability, it would also give people a sense of pride, a sense of belonging, just a better way of life. I'm living proof of this, this thing, and if it can work down in the Deer District, it can work in the rest of our city. Some people are performing the same type of work that I do in different places, and they're not even getting paid a third of what I uh, receive. I mean, people in hotels, janitorial workers, healthcare field, everybody in general from a union job uh, would have really uh, prosper and have a better way of life. Uh, I just got to say this. Uh, mm -hmm. Politicians want you to believe the economy is great. We're headed in the right direction. The legislatures want you to believe that they passed law after law to help poor and middle-class families, but it's, it's really a bunch of BS. The rich get richer, the poor stay poor. The city that I reside in is naturally just impoverished. The cost of living in, in our city goes up. The real truth is groceries have skyrocketed. The real truth is gas prices are high. The real truth is affordable housing is no longer a thing. The real truth is we energies are cutting lights and gas off. And the real truth is sometimes you have to decide for toiletries or being able to get a haircut. The real truth is that many of our children have gone back to school without proper clothing and school supplies. The real truth, our parents sometimes skip meals or their kids may have enough. The real truth is people don't have health care and dental care. The real truth is like, Politicians and legislatures don't care about your your well-being. I'd be willing to bet like $1,000 to a donut that this budget coming up will do more for pavement, bike trails, county parks than it will for the, the working class people. Oh, I'm sorry for the rent, but that's my truth. That's my co-workers' truth, and I'm standing on that. Thank you. Well, you're standing strong, and you're an articulate spokesperson for the real truth in your city and your state. Thank you so much, Troy, for sharing your insights on what MASH is doing for workers in Milwaukee and how unions change jobs. 
I would like to thank all of our speakers for sharing their experiences. This is not always something that is easy. And we have worked very much, again, to bring these voices to become the center of our work. I want to share three policy priorities that we have covered today with you all one more time before we open it up to questions from you, the audience. A reminder, please visit reimaginewisconsin.org. Reimaginewisconsin, one word, dot org, to learn more about this work, to share your stories, and join our efforts to demand better policy priorities for Wisconsin workers. To stay connected, please take a moment to fill out the survey found in the chat that my colleagues are placing to help us continue building this partnership across the state. Now I will hand it back to my colleague, Adrian to facilitate the questions from the audience. Thank you. I guess, you know, one of the kind of key policy priorities that was mentioned in the State of Working Wisconsin report was um, the need to expand like care services, um, such as like childcare, I was just kind of wondering if any of the panelists would be able to like talk about, you know, just the high cost of child care and like how that affects their work life balance or just kind of like affect, you know, just kind of how the child care costs are really kind of affecting them and, you know, why more support is kind of needed in that area. Joe, that was an excellent question. I'm going to direct that to the Worker Justice Wisconsin workers, first and foremost, because they have discussed um, uh, or, or mentioned uh, families um, and, and their experiences. We know, for example, that Faith does not yet have a family of her own, though she might have thoughts about why child care provision is important for all workers, so we can also uh, hear from her. So, uh, Frida, please um, ask the question to our panelists. Sí, entonces, sí, ¿cómo les ha impactado eh, el costo de cuidado de niños este, a ustedes en cómo eh, tienen que priorizar. Principalmente en el traslado, en la gasolina, el auto. Sí, sí, sí. sí principalmente, pues yo tengo una niña y, y no, todavía no he podido, o sea, meterla a la guardería porque fuimos a preguntar, pues, y todos nos decían que valía 400 dólares la semana, o sea, y pues no nos han pagado los sí. otros y se nos, yeah. ha bastante, claro. se nos ha hecho bastante difícil, pues, pues hay que buscar, pues, porque nos dijeron también que podíamos solicitar ayuda, como que nos dieron no, a pagar la mitad. Y unos te, te cobran 400, pero otros no te los aceptan nada más. Sí, porque por ser, por ser migrante nos piden social y todo eso para sí, la niña. Sí, so, um, one thing that really affects is, is just the, the transportation, the coming and going, the, cast, the cost of gasoline, uh, car payments. Um, uh, also... Um, he has a, a, a daughter and he hasn't been able to put her in kindergarten yet because uh, he went around asking different places and it costs 400 a week to have a child in, in a daycare. Um, and when your pay is inconsistent, that just isn't possible. Um, and a lot of other places are even more expensive and some other um, daycare centers um, require social security numbers and make it harder for undocumented workers or for immigrant workers to put their child there. Thank you very much, Troy. I'm curious if you hear um, from your fellow co-workers um, at the Pfizer Forum, for example, about their uh, struggles with um, child care provision or cost, both, and, and what are you hearing? Usually I get the, why would I work in child care is more than what I'm bringing home. So child care is a whole lot expensive. And like I said, $15 an hour. I mean, you'd be, be better off staying at home and taking care of your, your own kid. Uh, a lot of us that work down there are still in government programs. So that helps uh, cause it's just not enough to, to pay. So that's what we get with a lot of our people down there. Thank you, Troy. We have another question um, in the chat, Troy, specifically directed to you. You mentioned that unions help you with scheduling, but um, can do so much more. Could you share some of the other specific ways um, that unions support workers um, that you are aware of? So 
we uh, monitor and force implement the contract. Uh, it's more than scheduling. It's more than people being disciplinary actions. Uh, we help out in the hiring process. Uh, we help people through the new employee or, uh, orientations. Uh, anything that people could ask or need, we try to help out with. Uh, Sometimes during the pandemic, it was a big uh, unemployment issue thing. So we worked tirelessly through through that, helping people do things like that. Uh, we have a Milwaukee County Transit bus system thing that goes on that uh, they reimburse people to catch the city transit system. We help out with that. So we do a whole lot of different things in the building. Hello, everyone. Um... Mi pregunta es para los trabajadores de Workers Justice. Uno de, de los temas que estaban platicando es de aumentar el salario mínimo, que viene siendo $7.25 la hora. ¿Eso es algo que los afectaría a ustedes? ¿O cuál es su experiencia con el salario mínimo? So my question is just asking for the Workers Justice um, folks if they're, what is their experience with the minimum wage? And if they have any thoughts of, you know, raising the wage and that would also affect them or if it doesn't. Imagínense que una guardería vale 400 dólares. A siete horas, a siete dólares la hora. Imagínense cuántas horas uno tiene que trabajar. Nada más para pagar la guardería. De un bebé. Gasolina. Y aparte, eh, o sea, lo que es el transporte, la gasolina... Este, lo que es la renta, o sea, no, no. Los biles de la casa. No, no, no alcanza y para no. los biles de, lo de, de, de la casa, de la renta, de la. Yeah, for instance, imagine, um, you know, you're being paid $7.25 an hour, but you have to make rent, but you have $400 a week for child care, but you have to pay all your bills, and then all the, also the transportation costs. It, there's just no way to live on that. Gracias por su respuesta. Thank you very much. Um, JD Sandfield um, asks, how do workers in the farming sector compare with workers in more urban businesses in terms of wage theft? Laura Dresser, I think this might be a question um, for you, given your insights um, uh, as, as the labor economist that we have on the panel. Um, I am sorry, I do not have, um, I know that wage theft is right in specific sectors. I know agriculture, construction, and restaurants are three of the leading, also um, kind of sweatshop manufacturing are the three, are the places to really look for this kind of violation of labor law. But I don't know the, rel I can't actually say the relative scale. Um, there might be experience in the Worker Justice Wisconsin room with um, egg and other sectors. So I would um, perhaps uh, also kick it there and sorry not to have the statistical answer on the comparison. Rita, I don't know if any of the workers there that can, can come in on that or if uh, Rebecca from Worker Justice Wisconsin might also have some insights um, into uh, JD, uh, J, J. Davis Sandfield's question, uh, but we would welcome it here. One issue that we don't work a whole lot with agricultural workers, but um, a lot of, uh, you know, workers in Wisconsin in particular, um, dairy workers are in a different, like, class of their own that don't have the same protections as migrant workers. So migrant workers have their own set of um, rules about how they can be treated and the housing, and there's an actual involvement from the Department of Labor in in their conditions. Um, but yeah, dairy workers are excluded from that because they're not migratory, it's year round. And so they're particularly vulnerable. But even the workers that are migratory, um, they're vulnerable because they're indentured essentially to their visa status. And if they complain about their workplace uh, conditions or their pay and they get fired, even if it's an illegal firing, their visa is expired immediately. And so, they're also vulnerable in a unique way. I think Frida answered it very well. I'll leave it with that, leave it at that. 
Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, Jasmine writes um, in chat, can you describe the gender wage gap numbers for Dane County, especially for Black women and men? And or is there somewhere where we can see that breakdown um, in, in Black and white? Laura, do you have any um, extra um, commentary that you can provide Jasmine and the rest of the audience? Um, I I can I don't have Dane County numbers on wages, and um, I'm pretty, you know, uh, wage data at the county levels, you need lots of years, and it's pretty sketchy. But I think it is important to look at the, the I will use this question, this great question from Jasmine, to launch it just a little bit on the race and gender disparity that we see, even at the state level, in wages, um, which is probably reflected in Dane County. Um, uh, so, uh, the, you can look at in the wage chapter and I'm going to drop this in the chat, um, um, and see that median wages that folks are earning, uh, white men have the highest median wage at $27 an hour. Um, I know that some of you might think in terms, and this is the median is in the middle of the wage distribution. You might think in terms of, um, annual income. Um, so that's about $54,000 a year, um, $27 an hour for at the median wage for white men. White women are um, next up at $22.50 an hour. Um, uh, black women and black men are both basically at $20 an hour um, in at the median wage. Uh, Hispanic Men at uh, 1820, Hispanic women at 1802. These are the median wages for the state in 2023. Um, so those are those are 20%, I'm sorry, 25% wage gaps for the black workers relative to white men and 33% wage gaps for the Hispanic workers relative to white men. Thanks very much. Pretty stark differences and lots of room for improvement uh, for those workers, um, which is why raising the floor on a minimum wage um, or raising the floor more generally through union contracts and uh, worker organization is key to making sure that we can all live flourishing lives. I would uh, like to thank on behalf of Kids Forward, the High Road Strategy Center, the Milwaukee Area Service and Hospitality Workers Union, uh, the Havens Rights Center, Worker Justice Wisconsin, uh, the workers who spoke about their experiences today with us, um, as well as their struggles. They were incredibly uh, meaningful and powerful, um, and they will continue to be uh, something that we uh, need to keep an eye on. Um, and to you, our audience, for joining us today. Um, we do encourage you to, again, visit reimaginewisconsin.org to learn more about uh, the work um, and these policy priorities so that you can share your stories and join the efforts to demand better on behalf of uh, Wisconsin workers and their families. Uh, please don't forget to fill out the survey that was found in the chat to help continue to build a partnership across the state to ensure the well-being of all workers, because most of us do, in fact, work for a living. And remember, when we fight, we win. So thank you so much for joining us. Take good care.